uh, we're going to start anyway without you. <laughs> Amen. Oh, well, good morning. Welcome to Concord Baptist Church. Amen. Turn it the other way. Other way. It's got to go the opposite way of what you're looking at. There you go. That's my street. Lord God, he got it. I'm Pastor Frank Townsend, and I'd like to welcome you this morning. You said it before, Amen. All right, Brother Dave, pray for us, please. Amen. Lord, we got to say, Lord, again, would you thank you for this day, Lord God? Would you thank you? Because it's the Lord's day all day, Lord God. A day of worship, a uh, a day of praise, a, a day of rest, Lord God. And Father, you ordained it all, Lord. And it's all you and you only, Lord. And Father, we do pray for the ones that are not here. We have some sick ones out, Lord. And Father, we do pray, Lord God, that uh, you put your healing hand on them, Lord, that you, you help them, you, you restore them, Lord God, you heal them, Lord, and get them back in the house of the Lord. And Father, and for the ones, uh, other ones on the outside of the church that we pray for, friends and family and co-workers and all, Lord God, we pray, Lord, that uh, you put your healing hand on them and, and help them and, and bring them up, Lord. And Father, again, we do pray, Lord God, that uh, you protect our whole congregation uh, and our other loved ones and co-workers and family members from the corona, Lord. And Father, keep it far, far from us, Lord, and put a hedge about us, Lord, that it, it doesn't afflict any of us, Lord God. And Father, we're looking to hear from you in the Sunday school class and the preaching hour, Lord God, that uh, you've got uh, your, your messengers, your preachers and all, you got them anointed, Lord God, that uh, they got the message for us that you have us to have, Lord, that uh, you'll help us lift us up, Lord, and Father, to uh, strengthen us and carry us on through the, these vile and wicked and, and unsure days that we're, we're looking at. And we'll give you all the praise, honor, and the glory. We thank you and praise you, Lord Jesus Christ's name. We do pray. Amen. 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 Well, we was at Hobby Lobby yesterday, and Megan says, I want to make a necklace for grace. I said, make it for yourself first. Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> she got this butterfly and a leather strap, made a nice necklace. She says, well, I'll make it first and show it to her. If she likes it, I'll make one for her. Uh, I said, why do you want to do that for her? You know, <laughs> hey man, but that, she's thoughtful like that. You know, she thinks about you and wants to do stuff for people. Oh, yeah. Hey man, oh, all right. Well, huh? Yeah, didn't even start yeah. we didn't even start preaching yet, and they're running out the door. <laughs> Hallelujah! All right, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Mini Moon Jack. <laughs> I'm a home prepared where the saints abide just over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, our will, the happy angels, and just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host, I'll stand just over in the glory land. I am on my way to those mansions fair, just over in the glory land. There to sing God's praise and His glory share, just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angels band, just over in the glory just over in the glory land there with the mighty host I'll stand just over in the glory land. What a joyful thought that my Lord I'll see just over in the glory land. And with kindred saved there forever be 
just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand. Just over in the glory land, with the blood washed strong, I will shout. Just over in the glory land, glad hosannas to Christ the Lord and King. Just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land. Once like a bird in prison I dwelt, no freedom from my sorrow I felt. But Jesus came and listened to me, and glory to God, He made me free. He made me free, yes, He made me free, and He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see, for glory to God, He made me free. Now I am climbing higher each day, darkness of night has drifted away. My feet are planted on higher ground, and glory to God, I'm homeward bound. He made me free, yes, He made me free, and He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see, for glory to God, He made me free. Goodbye to sin and things that confound, not of the world shall turn me around. Daily I'm working, I'm praying to, and glory to God, I'm going through. He made me free, yes, He made me free, and He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see, for glory to God, He made me free. Amen. Is this the new ones up here, Teresa? Yes. All right. Here's some new old pass. Amen. September's. Old new pass or new old pass? New old pass. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, Brother Dave had this track he brought in 19 years ago. Uh, made free from sin's prison. It was about a local boxer, well, he was national boxer, Larry, I mean, uh, Jerry Blue Diamond Bell, and he was at the Lexington County Prison when we used to go there and preach. And I'll tell you, this is how people can fool you, though. He, I mean, he was, I saw the tears. I, I mean, I don't know if he's played the religion game before or not, but I mean, we're to accept people's testimony until they prove different. He did prove different, hey, man. But the fact is, you know, I, I don't regret it. He's got the gospel. He heard the word of God. Uh, last I heard, he was he couldn't box anymore because he was HIV positive. And, but uh, he was uh, coaching up at, uh, what's the name of that? Stanix. Yeah, Stanix boxing up there in Chapin. But, you know, it goes to show you, though, it just it looks so real, so real. And he seems so sincere. And you know, the Bible said the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. 
And they know how to play us sometimes. Amen. But you know what? He got the gospel. Amen. That's one thing. So don't don't ever feel bad about somebody going the other way. I mean, feel bad for them. But don't feel bad that, you know, you did your part. You gave them the gospel. Amen. And uh, just keep praying for them. They've had the word. Maybe maybe they'll come around yet. But if he was 31 then, he was he's 50 years old now. Amen. Amen. All right, Mr. Dale. Good morning, Concord Independent Baptist Church. Yeah! Uh, my name is Dale Simpson, and I am going to be here for Sunday school till they give me the hook. And uh, I hope to share with you some valuable insight into our Baptist history and past. We are going to continue on today in The Trail of Blood by J.M. Carroll. Uh, the author, J.M. Carroll, is a story in itself and do probably a whole Sunday school lesson. But we are going to pick up today on page 28 where we left off last week. And we're going to jump in there just as soon as we get a quick word of prayer in. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again for another beautiful Sunday morning. Lord, it's just absolutely fabulous outside. And we give, give all the credit to you, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you forgive us of any trespasses, anything that, that is not pleasing in your sight, Lord. That We ask that you... Look down upon us with favor to our prayer list. It is uh, long, and we ask for mercy and intervention where it be your will, Lord. And Lord, this morning I ask that you give me the verbal clarity to add some insight to our fabulous history, Lord, and all the praise be given to you. And these names I ask, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay. On page 24, we start out with number 20, if you got your books with you. It says, 28. 28. 28. Boy, I'm off to a great start this morning. Uh, 28, uh, item number 20 there says, the extreme limit of this little book precludes the possibility of saying much concerning these councils or lawmaking assemblies but it is necessary to say some things. These councils were called by the Catholic clergy or hierarchy to address certain issues that were going on outside of the church, some in the Western or Roman Catholic church and some in the Eastern, which was centered in Constantinople, which is today Istanbul. And uh, number 21 says, the first of these Lateran or Western councils, uh, those called those called by the popes, uh, was called by, and that's pronounced Calictus II, in A.D. 1123. There were present some about 300 bishops. At this meeting, it was decreed that the Roman that Roman priests were never to marry. This was called the celibacy of the priest. We, of course, do not attempt to give all the things done at these meetings. Uh, 1123 uh, is, is deep into the Dark Ages, and uh, they are appropriately named. Uh, moving on to number 22. A few years later, A.D. 1139, Pope Innocent II called another of these councils, especially to condemn two groups of very devout Christians known as, known as and I pronounce this, petro and the Arnolist. Uh, we'll start with the Arnolist. Uh, they were initially started uh, by a brother named Arnold of Brescia, which is B-R-E-S-C-I-A. He was an Italian, and it doesn't say that he was he was actually Catholic, but he had to almost been. He uh, was an a, a 
Italian political reformer. He did not like what was going on within uh, the governmental aspects that were tied to the church. Uh, he, uh, which included attacks on clerical riches as the Catholic Church had become very rich at this point. Uh, corrupt and the temporal power of the Pope, uh, and, and I would say that the Pope pretty much acted as he does today, pretty much like a, uh, he's a figurehead, but he still decrees and his word is final because he is supposed to have a direct line to God and uh, don't understand all of that, but uh, you can see in some of the, what we'll be covering here, it had some negative effects on us. The next, the Petro Brusians, uh, Br do what? Brusian. Brusians, as you want to call it. Uh, I could not find a proper pronunciation uh, it, for it anywhere, but uh, they were started by a guy named Peter de Burs, an interesting brother. And that's B-R-U-Y-S. And uh, <laughs> he had this pretty much as his, as his beliefs. Uh, did not believe in infant baptism. He did not believe in the erection of crosses at any kind of religious site, uh, which this gets him in trouble later. He did not actually believe in churches. Now, I don't know if he meant the church as a body, a governmental body, or a church like the building. I think a lot of the times in this age, they actually met in people's houses. So it may have been a building much the same as this. The veneration of crosses, which we kind of go through and uh, basically this falls under the pretense of ideology to him prayers to the dead uh once you have ceased uh there you, all you can pray all you want but it ain't going to do you no good no, not us living praying for someone that has already died uh the doctrine of transubstantiation uh, opposed the term anti-Baptist. I, I found this interesting. The uh, anti-Baptist, as we were called, which meant that we would re-baptize someone who had most of the time been baptized in, in, as an infant, mostly by Catholics, either by sprinkling or actual submersion. But he opposed this name because he didn't believe that you were actually baptized the first time. So thus, there was not a rebaptize or rebaptism, but you were actually just dumped or sprinkled. And uh, these little differences do mean a lot to some people, and apparently they meant a lot to him. Uh, he believed in total depravity, the depravity of man. Amen. And he didn't believe in any purgatory. He believed that purgatory was was a creation of the devil and that nowhere in the Bible did it really mention anything about being between heaven and hell. Uh, he was uh, believed in voluntary poverty that he lived a very modest and humble life, that all Christians should do that. Uh, he didn't believe in worshiping relics of, as he called it, rotten bones. The, uh, the idea of worshiping saints that had passed on, going to their tombs, going to their grave sites, and worshiping basically what were bones. Uh, he also felt like holy water was the same as rainwater and did not think that it had any significant meaning. If you wanted holy water, just run out into the rain and uh, you'll get a dose of it. Uh, and he believed vehemently about taking power away from the centralized church. Uh, that coupled with the fact that 
our our man here, Du Bois, or Du Bois. I never could find a true pronunciation of his name either. Du Bois. He also drew the ire of the Catholic Church by going out and removing crosses from anywhere he could find them, pulling them down, hauling them off to a centralized location and setting them on fire. And he also, uh, making good use of his carbon footprint, he would attach a piece of meat to them and cook supper and sit down and eat. <laughs> At some point, though, uh, our man Peter uh, was, he had incensed the local population of some town there in southern France to the point where the Catholics apparently were aware that he had hauled off their cross and was in the process of setting it on fire. They seized upon him and threw him into his own bonfire. And that was pretty much the end of, of Peter de Boers. And there is another interesting side note that in my readings this week, uh, there is also a dialect called petro -Berusian. And it is in the northern part of what is now Iraq. And it was, I believe, initially a uh, part of the Christian dialect in northern Iraq around Mosul over to Aleppo, which at the time that he lived uh, in the 11th and 12th century, this was the crossroads of the world. And they still, up until ISIS, got a hold of a lot of the Yazidis back five or six, eight years ago, there was still a dialogue, a dialect spoken in northern Iraq uh, that was uh, not spoken much in public unless you were in the marketplace and you saw somebody else that you knew. But I can't help but wonder if some of the folks that managed to escape the persecution of the Catholic Church over in southern France somehow made their way into northern Iraq, much the same as Tortullian did in the second and third century. And to he was going over to to live with and study with the Montanists or people of like minds and, and like beliefs. And I can't help but wonder if someone some of the Petro Berusians didn't make their way into northern Iraq and survive the persecution. Uh, it is believed that he was heavily influenced by one Claudius of Turin, who had these same beliefs. He, Claudius of Turin died in 832 and had much of the same beliefs. Now, he was a Catholic, and he didn't fare well with, with the Pope because being in close proximity to him and having these beliefs that I just listed, the, the Catholic hierarchy uh, kind of frowned on this fellow, but it is believed that he heavily influenced him, them, and the Arnolist that were, that we just spoke of here. Uh, the Arnolist were along about the same time as uh, the Peter de Boer's gang, and uh, they have not fared as well. There is actually, uh, it is well known that the Peter Berusians, Petro Berusians, uh, still have a name that uh, kind of rings around the uh, historical Baptist uh, historical studies. Uh, moving on here, that we go to 23. Alexander III called yet another in A.D. 1179, just 40 years after the last. And that, and that was condemned what they call the errors of the imp impieties of the Waldenese and the Albigenes. And the Waldenese 
Now this really gets interesting, y'all. The the wall beginnings also <laughs> the Waldenses. Waldenses. And the Albigenes. Albigenses. Uh, like I said, there is some a bunch of guineas in it. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of guineas. <laughs> the the Waldenese actually uh, have a very rich history. Uh, in Fox's Book of Martyrs, it is noted that they put up some tremendous fights through the years when when they were being persecuted by the Catholics, and they most notably of which, well, there's actually a whole laundry list of them, uh, they're known as the people of the valley. Uh, and after, they are believed to have descended from the followers of, of Claudius of Turin, who at some point had to head to the hills to get away from the persecution of the Catholics. So they moved into the steep mountains and valleys of the Southern Alps or Italian Alps, read of uh, bending over into Southern France. Uh, and they lived in this mountainous region for at least eight or 900 years. And they are actually still there today. They have some uh, I think they, the day that they celebrate is February the 17th is a day that uh, they hold in high esteem. They were in the 1400s on Christmas Day uh, involved in what they call the Christmas Day Massacre in which the Pope sent an army in and persecuted and killed over 3,000 of them. In 1484, the Pope sent in another army. They managed to, a bunch of them managed to escape to the number of 3,000 and they headed into a giant cave in the Alps, followed closely by the Catholic army and they found the cave and they would not go in because they were these were pretty fierce warriors. So they set a fire at the entrance, entrance and basically asphyxiated them. Uh, and over 400 mothers were found with babes in their arms as they all suffocated basically in the cave. Uh, in 1532, they were asked and accepted to join the Reformation movement that came from, I think, Luther and maybe Calvin. That. Uh, and that was not a good idea either because that brought them out into the open. And once again, the Catholic Church came down on them again. Uh, in, in 1560, they were ordered to a mass by the Pope. And they, of course, refused, which brought more persecution. Uh, in 1630, they were reduced by half from a plague, uh, the Black Plague, the, as we well know, the Black Plague killed off probably upwards uh, half to two thirds of all of Europe. Racist. Do what? You're a racist. <laughs> Bubonic Plague. <laughs> uh, in 1655, they call Bloody Easter. And that was another famous massacre where the Pope's army of 15,000 men marched into the areas, the mountainous region there in southern Italy and uh, northern Italy and southern France. Uh, they massacred over 3,000 and imprisoned another 12,000 in some miserable and horrid conditions. Uh, there were some stories in there of some of the interaction between some of the prisoners that I found just absolutely remarkable after eight or nine, 10 years of being in prison, they still kept their religious fervor and uh, were able to converse with one another through the walls in the prison. Uh, in 1689, 
uh, France, uh, once again, here, the, the Catholic hierarchy in France decided they were going to get in on this fun, and they began persecuting them from the French side. Uh, in eight, uh, in 1799, I'm sorry, a little before that, in the late 18th century, there was a battle in the Franco, not Persian, but Prussian War, Franco-Prussian, which was the Germans, and a bunch of uh, upwards of 400 Frenchmen were left on the battlefield. The Waldenese went out and actually buried the dead and administered to the wounded French soldiers that were left there to die brought them into their homes, did what they could do to convalesce them, and then loaded them up. They did whatever kind of makeshift carts and litters and carried them over the mountain pass. And the guy that was, was telling this pointed to the mount, mountain pass in the dead of winter and took these French soldiers by having to forge streams, having to uh, negotiate landslides all through this mountain gap over to the French side. And it is said when the French soldiers were, were home that they cried like babies, uh, just thankful that these Waldenese had done this. And in 1799, when Napoleon moved into this area, he went to some of the Waldenese clergy and actually asked them, because he had obviously heard about this, this incident, who was their mentor? And there was the mention of, of course, Claudius of Turin and another famous Christian. And uh, I've got his name here. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it. But he lived in the 400s. And, uh, but they believe that most of the Waldenese were mentored or uh, took their religious beliefs from the teachings of Claudius of Turin. And it, was su it left such an effect that Alfredo or Alto, Alto, who was the emperor of Italy in 1849, put a statue up, which had to fly in the face of people who didn't like ideology, but they put a statue up to, or a monument to commemorate what the Waldenese had done. And uh, closing here today, there is actually, they're spread out, there's a bunch of them in South America. They still inhabit this, the valleys of northern Italy and southern France. There is a group of them in western North Carolina. Between Boone and Banner Elk, there is a town called, and I've seen the sign dozens of times, it's called Valt, Valtanes, or Valtanere, and supposedly a bunch of the Waldenese moved in there and settled that area back 150, 200 years ago. So, and that brings us down to the 24th item there. And we're going to stop off there and I'm going to turn over to Tommy for the next half of Sunday School for today. Thank you. Amen. If you need 30, take it. Don't rush. 30. 30. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. What a blessing it is to be here today and a blessing to see the pastor here today. Yeah. How are you, pastor? Yeah. It's good. Yeah. So he's not yelling and screaming. I'll yell for him. Yeah. Woo -hoo. Good. There you go. <laughs> I just want to thank the Lord for everything he's done and bring us here today and thankful for the people who are here today. And, um, this whole weekend's been like, it's every, you know, getting out, working at the house has been fun, doing things. Uh, I want to say, I, I do want to say one thing, happy birthday to Lacey. 
because I know they're listening out here, so I'm going to say happy birthday. It is her birthday. And uh, I just I just thank the Lord that we we're able to come to worship him and to be here today. And I was uh, reading my Bible and studying again, like always. And, I mean, it's just been such a blessing. I'm thinking we always talking about, oh, what's wrong with America? What's wrong with the, us now? Because we took, you know, God out of schools. But that ain't the problem. We replaced, I wrote it down, we replaced God with things. And the Christians did that at home. They got comfortable being at home. And they replaced God with things. So me and my wife was going around cleaning up the house. And so what I wrote down was cleaning the house. It's time to clean up. Get ourselves right. Because like in Nehemiah, turn over to Nehemiah real quick. Nehemiah chapter 4. I'm just going to read one verse from there. You know, because what the devil want to do? He wants to get into the home and break the home down. And where does he go to? Not just the wife. Everybody goes, well, he goes to the wife, the weakest vessel. Guess where he does go when you allow it? He goes to your children. He gets to your children. Because we took God out of our homes by replacing him with things. And here's Nehemiah, you know, he had a love for Jerusalem, the walls, and he was wanting to, you know, and I, I'm reading here, it says, in verse 10, it says, and, and Judah said, the strength of the, the barriers and burdens is decayed. It's decayed. That's what's happened to our homes. A lot of things decayed. We took God out. And like I said, and replace him with things that are going to decay. And we're thinking, oh, I'm all right. It's all right. But our kids are watching us and seeing us take God and replacing him with other things. We're supposed to be raising our children up in a godly home. That's how we be, it began. And it says, and there, and there is much rubbish. We got so much stuff. In our lives, think about it, so much things in our lives that take us away from God and our children are watching these things because we claim we have a love for God, but yet we're busy doing other things. We're not doing godly things so our children can know this. The husbands and wives, they're supposed to love one another. Husbands are supposed to love their wives. Wives are supposed to reverence their husbands. Amen. That's Lord. You no, know, I'm just saying in the Lord, that's how we're supposed to be, right? We're supposed to be raising our children up in the Lord. But so many times, you know what happens? The dad gets lazy. That's it. The dad gets lazy, puts mom to work. And dad's too busy doing something else, puts the kids, hands them off to somebody else. That ain't what God intended us for to do. The husband's supposed to go out and have a job and work, provide for it, be a provider yeah, for the family. Man. I mean, women can work. That's fine. I'm all right with the women working if they have to. If if something comes on and they get divorced, they have to get a job. That's fine. But the man should be able to provide for his family. Yeah, man. That's the wife and the children. And the, you know what? Who the best babysitter in the world is? A mom. Come on, preacher, it is. Preacher. A real mom. One that raises her family. The husband is the head of his home. In the Lord. I don't mean you go and abuse your wife and she has to stay there. Of you sitting anywhere there. You don't have to abuse your children. So beat them with a rod. It won't kill them. But it don't mean to abuse them. It means discipline your children. So they can be raised up. But so many times, we just want to hand our problems off. Because the children are a problem. We didn't get to live our lives. So we hand them off. What's the, how do you expect the children to grow up? What is this generation now? Read it. Read what the Bible tells you. Oh, yeah, let me take my notes out. Yeah, here we go. And start with, you know what we need to do? First of all, we need to get right with God. That's right. That's Amen. our problem. 
we're not right with God. So how can we expect our family to be right? How can we expect anybody else outside of this church to be right? It all begins here with the head. Us to get right with God. <laughs> and I said, get right with God and he will show you how to clean your house. He will. He'll teach you. He'll show you what you need to get out your home and what needs to be in your home. That's what he'll do. Preach it, preach it. I, I don't know. And I wrote cleaning the house. And in Psalms chapter 51, we can turn over there real quick. Everybody knows this first. What David did, he prayed to the Lord. 51.10 says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right, right spirit within me. Amen. Right? Ain't that what it says? A right spirit within me. Renew it. See, we can build again. We can renew that if we turn to the God, if we turn to him for our problems. He'll show us how to get things right if we give him control, give him the reins. But I was thinking about the kids, how they grow up in ungodly homes, professing Christian homes. He's talking about children obey your parents. In the Lord. Read what the scripture says in the Lord. But what have we done? It says in Proverbs chapter, um, yeah, let's go to Proverbs chapter, uh, yeah, 30. I wrote down Proverbs 30. I'm not going to just quote the verses. I want to read exactly what they say. Verse 11. And, and our problem is, we hand our children off. It says in verse 11, 30, 11, it says, There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. Why is that? Because we replace God with things. The home's not right, according to God's word. So whose fault is it that we have this generation that's coming up this way? It's our fault. We got to realize it's our fault because we are professing Christians. We're supposed to be raising our children up. We're supposed to be teaching our children the godly ways, not the worldly ways. That's going to come natural. You don't have to teach none of that. Amen. That's a fact. That's something that comes natural. But teaching God's ways, that's different. That changes you. And that generation, are you, are you going to be to blame for that in your household? Because you were raising that new, that generation up, not as unto the Lord. You're not honoring the Lord. That's the problem. And it's not every one of the church in the whole, the whole church. It's only some. But yet you're, you're still part of the problem. Is that how it was intended to be? No, that ain't how it was intended to be. God intended us to raise our children, to teach our children. Psalms chapter 78. Let's go there. If you don't want to, I'll read it to you. Like I said, you got to get yourself right with the Lord first, like David did, created me. Show me, help me. That's what we ought to be praying for. Help me to raise my children. Help me to get my house right. As unto the Lord. Psalm 78, let's start with verse 1. It says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. Our fathers have told us. Oh, my goodness, the Father's telling who? And it says, we will not hide them from what their children. It says, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord. That's what we're supposed to be showing our children. Other people's children are supposed to be seeing Jesus in us, that we're obeying God's word, but we're a bunch of disobedient people. We are disobedient children to God. 
the one that are gods that have been birthed into the family. What a shame that your kids can't be raised in a godly home. Because, and it, it, it's no excuse, because it's your fault. It's my fault. It's not God's fault. Because he's telling us how to do things. He teaches us every single day. But we just want to replace him. I don't have time right now. I got other things to do right now. That's what we do. We just throw them to the side. Hey, and but when we in need of something, we'll call on them. And the kids see that. Hey, I grew up that way. When something bad happened, I seen my dad pray. That's the only time. Never prayed any other time. Christmas time, yeah, we had a meal. You'd pray. I don't know if it was for sure or what it was for, but we did. And I was wondering why we were praying. Something bad would happen. Be praying. That's how I grew up. They come natural. Godly people are different. They raise their children up in a godly home. They obey God's word. They are obedient to God's word. And it says, and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. How many, how many of your children see what God has done for you? How he's made you a new creature in Christ Jesus. Do your children see that in you? Have they seen Has your wife seen that in you? How do you expect your wife to do it if you're not doing it? Then the children ain't doing it. You pass everything down. Well, honey, it's your job to do this. Honey, it's your job to do this. Oh, no, husband, it's your job to get it right with God and raise a godly home. It's the man's job. Don't put it all off on the wife. She shouldn't have to have that whole burden. Her burden, she, to raise the children, cook, clean, whatever else may come, that's fine. But teach the children. If you have a godly home, all will be in order. Your home will be in order. What do children do after they leave the home? That's between them and God. But it's your job as a parent to raise the household up in a godly manner. Let them see God in you. It says, verse 5, For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known, what? To their children. That the generation to come might know them. Might know what? God's ways. How about that? It's right here in our Bible. Teaches us. But we don't have time. So I think it's time to clean up. Clean the house. And it's going to start here. It's not too late to rebuild. It's not too late. Not when God's in it. Amen. Amen. God can rebuild anything if you let him. He, can, he wants to rebuild. He wants that relationship between you and him. And he'll teach you how to raise your house. How to clean your home up. And it says <clears throat> that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Oh, my goodness. Anybody know any of the New Testament commandments? They knew how to live for God. It don't mean we're under the law. We're supposed to be obedient to God's word. How to raise your house. How to clean your home. How to raise your children. So this next generation to come isn't going to be ungodly. But we're the problem. Because we replaced God with things. We took God not out of school. We took it out of the home. We took him out. 
didn't let him run the home. We let the devil come in. Like I said, that was all natural. That nature is there. God wants us to raise children unto him. And and uh, here you go. What's it say in Proverbs 26? No, Proverbs 22, 6. 26. 22, 6. I got so much stuff I wrote down. 22, 6. Turn over one more. No. Nope. It says, and it says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. It says, train up a child. Not in the world. That ain't how we're supposed to be doing it. But so many times we want to teach them this and that. So they get notches on their sons, get the notches on their belt. See it? Hey, son, go do this. It's all right. Go do it. That'd be a check. Yes. That's a notch in your belt. Be a soccer star. That's right. Be whatever. Nothing about it's godly. We turned on God. He didn't turn. He's the same. Always. None of his ways have changed, Pastor. Not one. We change. God help us. That's what we need to be asking for. And what's it say in um, Ephesians chapter? Hey, let's go over here. I'm not going to go to the one I know not to go to right now. It says in chapter 6, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, I'm talking to fathers now, provoke not your children to wrath. Here you go. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Bringing them up in the Lord. So when they leave home, they can raise their family unto the Lord. Raise the children up. That will be godly children. So many times we just, like I said, we hand it off. We hand our children off. Then they get abused, all these things. They get more ungodly things. They see mama and daddy doing what they want to do. They see mama's night out, daddy's night out, all these things. So they raise up thinking they're supposed to be that way. I even got family members. I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong to have separate bank accounts because I made this money. This is my money. I made this money. This is mine. So I'm going to spend mine and then whatever. We'll just pay the bills together. But this money is mine. I didn't know that. I, I was raised that when daddy brought home money, it was, it, was, it was his to tell mama what to do with and how to pay the bills. If she didn't know how to do it, my mom was very good with paying bills. So I had to get that straight. God God, he, he gives you a help meet. He gives you somebody that can control money. Because I'm i I'm thankful for my wife. Thank the Lord gave, gave him to me, her to me. Because money with me is awful. I like to spend it. Well, she won't let me just spend money. She takes it and writes it all out on the calendar. And every bill is paid exactly the time. This is how it's going to be. This is how many payments it's going to be. And I say, huh, I want a new gun. She'll go over to the calendar, start counting. Well, in about two years from now, you might be able to start on one of those. But she pays the bills. I'm thankful for that because I go out and work. It's hard to keep up with everything in the home. And I, I, I wish and I pray that, that, that we'd have children in the home, that we could raise them up unto the Lord. But we don't. But, you know, our grandchildren and all, they should see Jesus in us. They should see that we Oh, that we want a godly home, that we have a godly home. But so many times, we just hand them off. We don't want responsibilities. We, hey, sometimes we pile all our stuff on our wives when we shouldn't be. Like I was talking about, give her all the bills to pay, give her all this, and make her have to, have to go to work. 
you got to go to work. So I sit home. Right? Sorry, Rasmus. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's We don't have no men in, in, in America no more. That's the problem. No men. Nobody wants. That's right, Dale. <laughs> that's it. We don't have no men. We let women take over. Come on. Look at the politics. Look who's taking over. Seriously. God didn't intend it that way, Brother Phil, did he? Crazy white women. That's exactly right. <laughs> we put women in control because we just want to sit home. I, I, You know what? It's too much of a burden on me to do this or do that. I'd rather just let my wife take care of the problem. Hand it all off to her. And now what we got? A bunch of ungodly people. And our children are doing what? Are turning up ungodly. Because of us. Because we replace God with things and we just want to hand him off. Say, I'm going to hand this burden off. I don't want it any longer. That's a shame. Shame on the church. And the church ain't just a building, y'all. Get us right. It's here. It's an individual that's in the body of Christ. That's the church. The body. And if the, the man's not doing his job unto the Lord, it's not going to work out. You're going to have a broken home. Them walls are going to come tumbling down. Your family's going to separate. They're going to go go live ungodly lives. They're going to, and it's going to get worse and worse. Each generation is going to get worse. Amen. If we make it through the next one, we'll see it's going to get worse. The Bible tells us so. But you don't have to let you don't have to play it just in with everybody else. You raise your family unto the Lord. That's what the men are supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be making a stand for the Lord. Then your wife, she don't have all that stuff on her. And if she can raise the kids, she can do all the things that a, a wife is supposed to do or does. I'm not going to just put stuff on them, things. I grew up, like I said, I grew up, my mom, she cooked, clean. She did things. She took, you know what? Not one time was we allowed to leave her sight. Except, it, it, you know, except go to the bathroom, whatever you may have as you got older. But we were right there. Mama was always with us everywhere we went. Wasn't allowed to spend the night at people's houses. Never. And I don't regret that. I'm thankful for that. Thank the Lord that he put me in a, a home where mom and dad stayed together. Amen. So that I that that I receive his salvation and get saved. Didn't have to go through the things that some of these children are gonna go through because their parents are ungodly. That's the ones we ought to be praying for. Think about the poor children having to be raised. Oh, never mind, not even being raised, being handed off. No natural affection. Man, like it said, it says, and you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up. Bring them up. Teach them God's ways. Be a godly father in your home, outside of your home. That'll just give you something to think about. I said, get right with God, and he'll show you how to clean up your house. He'll Amen. help you. He will lead you and guide you if you allow it. Amen. So many times we just want to, like I said, hand it off. I don't want that responsibility. That's all I have this morning, Pastor. Amen. Brother Dale, I think there is a place called purgatory. You said, you know, the place between heaven and hell. For a Democrat, it's when it's on the earth when Trump's in power. They probably feel like they're in purgatory. There's anyway. a ski resort in Colorado. That's purgatory. Amen. What's ailing Rush Limbaugh? You ask. Huh? What's ailing Rush Limbaugh? Other than he's got cancer. That's all. The Bible says in Psalm 100, I mean Psalm 77, verse 13, "The way, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary." 
who is so great a God as our God. Amen. I don't think there's people out there today that realize how important it is to be into the house, being in the house of God when the doors are open. If some other something else comes along, they'll do it. And I've been looking at some of this stuff, uh, Ramsey and stuff, these self self help financial geniuses and all this other junk. Do you realize that if you just read the Bible? And especially in the Proverbs, and obey it, you'd have more sense than them idiots that are peddling their stuff to sell to you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Mm. I thought about this. We have a situation that we dealt with this earlier in the week. Tommy had to went to Georgia. When he got down there, he had to turn around and come back because a certain person's uh, wife was talking about doing harm to herself, and he was coming back to to get the kids and and uh, all this stuff. And I thought, you know, you know what's wrong with these women that want their freedom, and you know they're looking to live their own life, have their own money, do their own thing, you know. You know what it's all about? Hey, Captain Jim. What it's all about is they're trying to find peace. But the peace is in, obe is in obeying God. Amen. Amen. Uh, makes me laugh is some of these people, they'll go to a bar to find a wife or a husband and <laughs> think that everything's going to be all right and they're going to lose them right back in the same place. Amen. But I've heard these people talk about trying this religion, and that religion, and this program, and that program. And I, I'm thinking, I wanted to text them and say, you know, you've tried all the other stuff. How's it working for you? Amen. They're having pity party on themselves. I'm just going to commit suicide. Then they'll be sorry. No, idiot, you'll be sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Hand them the gun. <laughs> Help yourself. If you're that stupid. Amen. The problem is you're depressed because of the sin in your life. That's where your depression comes from, from disobedience to God. And you'll try every other way in the world except the Word of God. The Bible says that if we obey it, that we'd have peace and we'd have joy. But you know what? Just like the folks in the wilderness is ate up with rebellion. I think I got my, what was it, my third ticket now? Fourth <laughs> ticket in the last couple months. Amen. Got one right out here in front of the church this week. Yep. Amen. No seatbelt. I can't stand to wear a seatbelt. I didn't. I haven't worn one for years. I make the kids wear them, but I, I didn't wear it, and it was eating on me. I just can't stand that thing across my chest. But uh, I had it on by the time he pulled me over, because he sits up here in number six, and uh, he come up to me. He says, uh, "How you doing?" I said, "I don't know yet." <laughs> Well, I pulled you over because you didn't have your seatbelt on. I had it on then, you know, and I says, how do you know? <laughs> he said, I saw you, <laughs> and I got good eyes. <laughs> well, I'm under the church sign. I couldn't lie. <laughs> I said, man, I just sent the last one in. He says, why don't you wear it? I says, I feel constricted across my chest. I really do. He says, well, Talk to your doctor. I said, I did, both of them, my cardiologist and my family doctor. They said, we're not going to do that for you. <laughs> so the guy, I'll tell you what, it was such a pleasure pleasure and a blessing to get a ticket from that man. Amen? Really? Really was. i tell you who the guy looked like. He looked just like the guy on the new Magnum PI guy. 
you know, there used to be the old Magnum Tom Selleck, but this is the, the new one. And he stood there, and he come up by the car. I said, listen, I've been sick. I just took a COVID test. I don't know. You don't want to get close. So he stuck his mask on. And uh, he looked at me, and he says, you know, I just got my dad to finally wear a seatbelt. He said, I didn't wear one either until I got on the police force and I saw how many deaths could have been prevented. Now, I know there's exceptions. And I mean, he was the sincerest, nicest young man. And he says, please try to wear it. So you know what I've been doing ever since? You're a law-abiding pastor. You're a law-abiding pastor. <laughs> I'm a law-abiding pastor. I'm wearing a seatbelt. <laughs> Matter of fact, I got here this morning, went to get out the car, and I couldn't get out. <laughs> I was like, I got to hook the seatbelt. <laughs> Still can't stand them. I said, to, I said when the other officer got me the last time, I said I had it down around my stomach. and uh, But I didn't do that until he, I didn't lie to the man. I said, I got it down here around my stomach. I did. I said, when you pulled me over. I had the seatbelt on around my stomach. And <laughs> this, that cop said, no. He said, that's improper. I said, well, don't you think you ought to be writing this up as improper seatbelt use? We don't have a code for that. <laughs> they gave me a ticket for not having one. <laughs> I said, I just paid the 25 bucks, keep going. But uh, anyway, I, I'm glad. I said, I, I need to set the example. But you know, years ago when they started this seatbelt stuff, they weren't supposed to give you a ticket until unless they pulled you over for something else. It's a secondary law. It's a secondary law. And now they're sitting there with binoculars and watching you, night vision, amen, and, and doing this. Has anybody ever questioned or gone to look to see if that law has ever been changed? No, they stuff the legislature's not for money. They changed it a year later, the primary law. That's what happened. Did they? Yeah, well, that, then the guy says, well, I have another ticket for you. That was not yes, not the one this week here, the one last week. I said, for what? He said, your tag's been expired since July. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, oh, for crying out loud. He said, I'm going to let you go, though. I said, but you got a ticket, you know. And uh, I get home, and I'm looking through registration. I got one that says, expires in September of 2020 and another one that says expires July of 2020. So I looked at the plate numbers and they were different. And the one that expired in July was the plate that's on the truck. I don't know how it happened. I forgot about it anyway. Tommy's been riding around for two months without one. Hey, but, huh? I, I got it you got it now. Yes. You got it now. <laughs> hey, Ben. Well, listen, I enjoyed Sunday school classes. Hey, Ben. And, uh, Appreciate all the work they put into it. Appreciate Brother Tommy doing the services, the last couple services. And uh, appreciate Dale. He does try and dig and work. I noticed he had a bunch of notes there this morning. I thought, Lord, I hope he don't go through it. No. <laughs> but he does make it a little interesting because, I, you know, stuff I never studied, history. <laughs> and uh, things like that. So it, it's... it's uh, it's kind of exciting to me. I don't know. The rest of you, you know, I don't know what you think of it, but I like it. What's that? Is, is, is that you, you saying something? <laughs> hey, man. All right. Well, we're not we're not going to stop. We're going right into the next service. If you've got to go wee-wee or anything like that, you know where the restrooms are. Kind of slip around there, and then we'll just have the ladies come on up and sing. Uh, we'll get Brother Dave to go ahead and open us in a word of prayer again. Close us out the first one, open the second one. <laughs> Do it any way you want. Amen. Oh, Lord, we got to say the Lord. We do thank you, Lord God, for the Sunday school classes again, Lord, and for everything that was said and done, Lord. And Father, I, I do uh, enjoy the, uh, the history lessons on the, uh, the beginnings of the Baptist, Lord. And yeah, amen. Father, it's very educational. And Father, it's uh, it's just a good thing to have and a good thing to know, Lord God. And Father, uh, we're looking forward here to the the next service, Lord, and the the, the singing, Lord, and the, the preaching of Thy Word, Lord. And 
in scripture reading, Lord God. And Father, I, I do pray that uh, you have the pastor anointed with the message you'd have us to have, Lord. And, and Father, that uh, we're ready to receive it, Lord. And we've uh, asked you to, to anoint the uh, services before we even got here this morning, Lord God. And Father, to, to help, to encourage the pastor, Lord. And, and Father, uh, we do thank you and praise you for that, Lord. And again, we do pray for the ones that are not here, Lord God, that, uh, Father, you put your healing hand on them and, and get them back in the house of the Lord. For we miss them. We miss all of our brothers and sisters that are that are not here present with us, Lord God. And Father, we, we do pray, Lord God, that uh, in the message, Lord, that uh, you strengthen us and, and carry us on through this week. And we'll thank you and praise you in Lord Jesus Christ's name. We do pray. Amen. 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 I sort of got under conviction there with uh, Brother Tommy. I, if if my wife passed away, I'd be in a mess. Amen. I don't do nothing. When I was on the road, I'd just call her, see how much money she needed. She'd tell me what she needed, and I'd get the money back there. Amen. Uh, she uh, she told me, she says, now if I die, there's an insurance policy over here for this much, and then there's one over here for that. I got the thing, that could be lucrative. But but uh, anyway, I mean, it went in one ear and out the other when there wasn't nothing there to stop it. Amen. And it just, bing. And uh, I wouldn't know where to find a thing. She started telling me about Jasmine's school and where all the paperwork was and the notes and all that. I don't have a clue. Amen. I'd have to hire a detective to come in to help us to find all that stuff. But you know, my father-in-law, my father-in-law, he was a drunk from England, ship's carpenter for the Queen, and uh, he came to Canada, and then he moved to California, and he was building boats in the shipyard, and and uh, he designed his own hull, offered it to the company that he was working for. They rejected it. He took it to the competitor, and long story short, he became vice president of the company. Amen. He was expert carpenter. If you ever look up the Cutty Sark, the T Clipper, it's uh, dry docked in in uh, on the Thames in Greenwich, England. And if you look at all that teak wood work there in the entrance for the museum there now, he did all that. And uh, I had uh, all the pictures, the last of the pictures that the they actually have a captain and a crew that goes with that ship. And he had the the last of the pictures that completed that history. And when I was over there for his funeral, we delivered them to the captain. Amen. But uh, anyway, he got saved. But that man, I mean, he took care of the finance in his home. He wrote everything down. He had his books. He did everything. And when he died, he had it all laid out. What his wife needed to do and how she was to do this and do that. He had the money set up. Amen. Uh, where to go with it, what to do with it. Amen. And took care of her all the way up until she passed. Amen. And I guess that's what we ought to do. We ought to have control of our home and finances, know where everything's at. Amen. And I think that's where a lot of families mess up because sometimes you don't have a woman that'll take care of the bills and, you know, do it right. Uh, there's a, I've heard stories of people that have turned stuff over to their wife. And, and I know one now personally that thought his wife was paying the mortgage and everything. She was out doing her thing. And next thing you know, they're foreclosing on the house. Amen. He lost everything. So we're, who's the weaker vessel? The woman. She's the weaker vessel. Who'd the devil go to in the garden? Went to the woman. Amen. So we're supposed to know what's going on. I don't know if I ever do that, but we're supposed to. <laughs> Amen. You all ready, ladies?
thy kingdom sure to thy shore. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my sitting home sick all them days you know I was bored I pulled the bass down I'm looking at all these instruments hanging on my wall in the rec room you know violins mandolins ukuleles electric guitars Spanish guitars acoustic guitars and hey man bass guitar <laughs> all this stuff I said well I ought to try one of them anyway it didn't sound too good hey, amen <laughs> but huh Sabotaged my banjo. Oh, yeah, I got a banjo hanging on the wall. I've been tempted to call the old music trainer back up again, instrument teacher, eh, man? But uh, anyway, uh, Megan come out and said, with that scruff, she says, you know what you look like? I said, yeah, Foster Brooks. I said, who's Foster Brooks? He was that old, uh, that drunk uh, comedian that played a drunk, you know, and he had beard. So I said, looked it up for it. I showed her what, and the guy said, I said, shared his, he has not on Facebook, but he says, yeah, I've been married three times. I said, three times? I said, yeah. So what happened to your first two? He said, well, my first wife, she died from eating poison mushrooms. So well, what happened to the second one? Said, she died of a fractured skull. I said a fractured skull. He said, "Yeah, she wouldn't eat the mushrooms." That's <laughs> 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 uh, rough, isn't it? <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, ladies. <laughs> Brother Steve, pray for us. End of the service. Great Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day, Lord. Just thank you now, Lord. It's time, Lord, to get into your word, Lord. I just pray for the service, Lord. I just pray for the scripture reading, Lord, and for the preaching, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that you give us what we need, Lord. We're a needy bunch, and you know exactly what we need, Lord. I just pray that, uh, Lord, that we have ears to hear. Lord, just pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You'll be turning to Psalm chapter 1. Got a bunch of verses we want to go through. But uh, I was doing a lot of thinking this week, and I thought, why aren't we winning souls? Why aren't we doing more for God? Why is the church, like it is, kind of stagnant? And... Uh, we hear some good messages sometimes, amen, but the problem is they go in the ear while you're sitting here and you think, yeah, that's something, and it might even touch your heart, and you walk out the door and forget about it. Yeah. People today, they always either have to have a radio or television or something going. Or be on our cell phones. Amen. We don't take time anymore to meditate. And I thought about that word meditate. And I started looking up some verses on meditate. <coughs> the things that we do and the things that we study. I had a man say that whether you're doing, whether you're studying physics or mathematics or whatever, as a Christian, you ought to be able to see God in what you're studying, not try to find God in what you're studying. Amen. 
And I thought about that. There's times that I used to sit out here and just look at nature, watch the bees, just look at the squirrels, and you get life's lessons from them, and you see the majesty of God, of what he has created. And your inner man, the soul, is excited about what it's seeing. You know, like getting up at almost midnight to go out and watch an eclipse. Why? Because I believe what the Bible says. And you go out and you look and you see the moon turn blood red. And you see the work of redemption in nature because he said the heavens declare his glory. Amen. The heavens declare his glory. When I look at something, I, I hear things on the news like I've said before about the ozone depletion. And I look in the book of Hebrews and I find out that the garments are, the heavens are waxed old as a garment. What's that? It's like I said a couple weeks ago. These women go out and buy these jeans and stuff with holes already in them. Pay some outrageous price because some nut put their name on it. Amen. So they can run around with holes in their clothes. Well, how's that garment get that? Well, the natural way was you used to wear them till they wore out. And then you'd fold them up or throw them out or cut them up for grease rags or something. Amen. Well, he said the heavens wax old as does the garment. They're going to have, it's going to have holes in it. That's why the Lord said one day he's going to make a new heaven, a new earth. When you look at things and you see freshwater glaciers in salt water. <laughs> when he talks about in the book of Job, the, the springs of the sea. When they talk about ice or on Mars, you think about the pre-Adamic earth where the waters abated, residue left on some of these planets, as cold as it is out there, what do you think it's going to do, melt? <laughs> when they're talking about seeing these, this bright thing way out there with the brightest or the strongest telescope in the world, and I think of the New Jerusalem, that heavenly city that's sitting on the other side of the ice, you say, what ice? The one that's covering the face of the deep right now? The face of the deep is frozen, the book of Job says. Amen. What's on the other side? God's throne, God's heaven. Amen. Those are the things that I see. You know where I got I get this stuff from? Drugs. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> that's what some people are probably thinking. Boy, whatever he's got, it must be good. <laughs> I get it because I read the Bible and I say, Lord, how's that work? Or Lord, show me. I take the verse serious. It said, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. When you look and you're looking through the Bible and you're believing it. And then you meditate on it. What's wrong with the church today is we don't meditate on anything. We're rushing from here to there, running around in circles Amen. like a hamster in a cage on a wheel. We've always got to have something in our ears. The TV's got to be going. Uh, how are you going to meditate on the Word of God if you got the TV or the radio going? Everybody you see walking up down the street with a cell phone got something plugged into their ears. How many stop to meditate on the message? After they leave here. How about when you're reading your Bible. And you're not just reading it. So you can get through it. And say I've read my Bible through. But you're reading it. Because you want to get something from God. Amen. You know how it was in the garden. Every morning. When Adam woke up. He was full of joy. That's before Eve. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just joking, ladies. Take it easy. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but I mean, really, Adam and Eve, they'd wake up. They're in this beautiful garden, garden of God. 
and they could see in nature God. And they communed with him in the cool of the day. God communed with his creatures. And like I said before, it's not the garden, it's the God of the garden. You got to get back to God. As Brother Tommy was talking about this morning, I thought, boy, that was interesting. Come right in the place where I'm going. Amen. But to stop, slow down, just take time to meditate. Some people just have to always be busy. Like somebody on meth. Amen. Fiddling with things. Always move, got to do something, but never get nowhere. Never accomplishing anything. You need, need to just stop. You know what? Be good. When I was at Gethsemane, Pastor Randall encouraged all of us when we came. When we came to church to have a notebook and a pencil. I think Johnny does that. You doing that today or do you give up on it? Okay. He got his pen and paper. And you write down the verses in the notes and you go back and look over them again. Meditate on what was said. Eat the meat, throw away the bones. Amen. Might even get a good joke now and then you can write down. <laughs> Amen. Psalm chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse 1, but it's verse 2 that we're going to. He says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, it says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight. If you're saved and you're in communion with God, you delight in his word, in his law. And he says, and in his law doth he what? Meditate. When? Day and night. Meditate day and night. Meditate day and night. You know, if our mind is so full of everything we're going to do the next day instead of thinking about the Lord. I remember back when I first got saved and I got off the road. And I was working for Bill Layton. He was teaching me heavy equipment. And I, I'd get to work in the morning. And I'd work as hard as I could for him. I ran into a problem. I'd stop and pray. I asked God to show me, give me the wisdom. You know, you've heard it all before. And uh, I couldn't wait till lunchtime. You know why? I'd get my Bible. I'd sit down, grab something to eat, and read my Bible. But during my work, I was meditating also on the things that I had read. Then I couldn't wait to get home and get a shower, <coughs> excuse me, and eat supper so I could sit down and read my Bible. Then I meditate on it. I used I love early in the morning when you go outside now, now that the humidity's dropping, where you can go outside and sit down. You can hear the birds, it falls in the air, you can smell the leaves and stuff. But and go out there and sit and just look at the sky. I mean, these are things that God had to even humble himself to even look at. But yet we can see his majesty in it. I don't think there's an artist could paint a picture like the Lord does on a sunset sometimes or a sunrise or out across the ocean. I like to just sit out there and think about these things. I mean, when, when, the, when the Bible says that, talks about the riches or the wealth of a snowfall, I said, wonder what he's talking about here. That's when I went and looked it up and found out that there were so many dollars and cents in a one inch snowfall per acre of nitrates and, and, and stuff, the natural fertilizer and stuff. Then it dawned on me why this soil, well, I'll tell you what, when we went fishing up north in Pennsylvania or something, or New Jersey, you just stick a shovel in there and you flip it over and there's all these night crawlers and the real dark, rich earth. And you look at the cornfields out across the Midwest and all, and you see uh, how beautiful the, the corn grows. And you think, well, how did it get like that? Where's the most snow? 
Amen. Natural stuff. Down here, our fields are on meth. Amen. <laughs> They're shooting up the crops with, with chemicals. Amen. But I, I just, well, not all chemicals because we work on some of the trucks that haul the fertilizer to the field. Amen. Nature's best excrement. <laughs> Amen. Psalm chapter 19. We're going to look at some verses here. We won't be long. But he says that. Psalm 19 and verse 14, familiar verse. He says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. What you think about all day, what you meditate on, is it acceptable to the Lord? <clears throat> the words that come out of our mouth are not always acceptable and pleasant to the Lord. You know why people don't grow in the grace of God and grow in faith? Is because they won't heed the word of God. It's because they won't meditate on the word of God and examine themselves and meditate on their state. Once you start to do that, you'll see things start to change. When you read your Bible, do you just pick it up to get something read so you can say, I read it? Or you sit down with it and say, Lord, show me something out of your word today. Lord, op open my eyes. Let me see. You know, I, I never read much of the Old Testament when I first got saved. I didn't understand it. <laughs> I just did what my pastor said. He said, read Romans to, through Philemon. And get Paul's doctrine, church doctrine down. And I do that, and then pretty soon I go back to the Psalms. And after that, then I go back to the Old Testament, and things started making sense. I'm a slow learner. <laughs> but that's when he started showing me things. And I said, Lord, I want to please you. And so while I was down, while I was sick, I begin to re-examine myself again. I said, Lord, that's the things that I've let slip the last few years. You remember me always talking about wanting to get back to where I had that fellowship to where your, your heart is constantly just, whoo, wow. It's like a rush all the time. That's what the Lord showed me. He said, you used to meditate. You used to take your time and want to be, just be with me. So that's right. Then I got too busy. I forget who it was the other day said to me. Oh, I remember now. But they said, uh, you know, you get to pray and all of a sudden you feel like you got to rush through it. Amen. Well, who's doing that? Somebody don't want you to pray. <laughs> Amen. But just to stop. I'm telling you that television is the worst thing I ever brought back in my house. Amen. Because it used to be such a blessing when you got home in the evening, especially in the winter months coming up, it gets dark early, but just to get home and get that shower and get a meal in you and sit down in a nice cozy chair and open up your Bible or open up a good book, a good book. And just sit there and read. And the Lord begin to just get excited here. The Spirit of God begin to work. You see, we can come up with some good messages. I think that what's ruined the church was the internet for these pastors that were wanted to go play golf all day and during the week or even on Saturday and then Sunday they just punch up a message. Amen. There was no meditation in it no thought no uh, they took what somebody else wrote and it's not real to them and so they just get it from their head to your head but by the time you get out the door you've forgotten what it was 
But when it comes from the heart, then it gets in the heart. People don't want to take time for God anymore. You know, except for emergencies, I wish we went back to the old phone days, you know. I get frustrated now because it's, the cell phone doesn't dial fast enough. <laughs> but you remember, people just had to wait. Life was easier. You realize that? And it seemed like we had more time. Not today. Just ask old flip phone Dave. <laughs> he won't come up. He just keeps getting him a flip flown, right? <laughs> Amen. Makes me want to go back to it. But, you know, it's kind of handy sometimes having that computer in your hand. Siri, call preach. Yeah. <laughs> call fleet. Call this one. <laughs> Call that one. It does it for you. But also hinders you too. Look if you would please to Psalm 77. Psalm 77 verse 12. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of, all, talk of thy doings. What's he going to meditate on? I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Stop and think. Meditate a little while about what God has done. You know, sometimes I feel bad. I said, Lord, don't let me feed the, feed the buzzards today. You know, when a squirrel runs out in front of you. Lord, I don't want, you know, let somebody else feed them. I don't want to run them over. The only ones I want to get is the ones I saw on TV before where they run out there and then they go. <laughs> I watch God's creatures. <laughs> it was funny. I saw this vulture come down and he's in the middle of the road. And I'm thinking, what the heck's he doing? I don't see nothing. I finally, as I went past, I realized what he was doing because he took off and there were a few pieces, little pieces of flesh here and there. I said, I, he was having some squirrel nuggets. <laughs> little afternoon snack. <laughs> there wasn't some big old animal there. He's tearing it apart. He's just having little snacks, <laughs> tidbits. Amen. You ever think like that? No. <laughs> Jeez, making me feel bad now. <laughs> Psalm 107. In verse 43, the last verse of that chapter, he says, Whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Who, those that are meditating on his word and meditating on his glory, meditating on what he does. You ever stop and just meditate on what heaven's going to be like when you're reading in the book of Revelation or something, or, you, or you're or you going through Ezekiel and, and you see these creatures and you read about them and say, boy, you ever try to picture them in your mind? Hard, isn't it? Can you imagine John on the island of Patmos? Golly. All the things he got to see and to prophesy on. You know, I believe God will show you some things out of this book, too, that will get you excited. If you'll just take the time. Amen. Psalm 119. In verse 97. He says, oh, how, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. 
all the day. You see, there's something wrong with us because our mind's on everything else. Amen. What are these self-helpers going to do for you that really help you? What they're trying to do is help you out of your money so they can have it. Everything that they can tell you, God's already told you. If you'll just read it and obey it. Amen. He tells you how much money to hold back. Amen. He tells you to cast your bread upon the waters. And after many days shall return unto you. He tells you to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. For they shall prosper that love thee. When the work's been slowing down. I, every morning I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And when I see the work slowing down. I kind of want to panic sometimes. Because you want to keep everything going. And then I say. Well Lord. I'm praying for the peace of Jerusalem every day. I said it'll come. Amen. Amen. So many things that people making money off of the world that they can get for free right out of the word of God. Amen. I want to look back at a uh, Verse 48. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. You know, the Lord's been convicting me a long time about that seatbelt. He really has. Obey every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Oh, I despise it. And then I got a ticket. I said, well, it's that stinking little truck, that little S10, doesn't have any window tint. They can see right in. And it used to work pretty good. If I went by one, I just threw my hand up there like this. You know, I'm driving. That worked pretty good. Then all of a sudden, I put it up there, and they're still spotting me. How in the world are they doing it? And I finally said, all right, Lord. I told the officer, I says, uh, I hate wearing this thing, but I'm going to wear it. I says, by the way, I'm sitting here in work clothes all scruffy. He says, I'm the pastor here. <laughs> it's important. Because people are watching us, amen. But you know why you get away from it? You can't control yourself sometimes because you're not meditating in the word of God. You're not desiring to obey it to please him. What we're trying to do is please ourselves. If you really want to please him. Isn't it funny how these young people that go out here and cuss, up, cuss an elderly person out. And, you know, and do all the stuff they do. Get in front of their parents. They know how to hold their tongue. You know there's adults that know how to hold their tongue in front of certain people or clients or something. So they know how to do it. But they don't want to do it. I thought about them people in Pittsburgh where those people were sitting there eating outside. And they come in and. That one black woman grabs that piece of steak up and takes a bite out of the steak and someone else grabs the other one's uh, potato, then goes over and gets his other lady's drink and just guzzles it down and just looks at her and she's saying, that's my drink. I thought I'd like to be sitting there with my gun. Hey, Amen. And when you, I said, when you reach for that steak, you won't reach it. You won't ever reach for another one with that hand. Hey, Amen. I can't believe how people won't stand up to that stuff. Amen. Huh? Yeah, I know. They'll go to jail. I mean, I know we will. We know what we had to go through just because we had to shoot. <laughs> Amen. But I'll tell you what, you just might help somebody. But see, we don't want to sacrifice ourselves. <laughs> Turn 
it, it gets so frustrating watching people just taking advantage of other people. Look in the book of Joshua, chapter 1. Joshua in chapter 1. He says in verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Amen. Do you understand? The only way you're going to please God is by doing the things that are written in here, and the only way you're going to know what's written in here is by meditating in it. And then look what he says. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Amen. You want success in your business or anything else? Put God first. Put God in there. I've watched the people that have really put God in to their business and God has blessed them. Don't do it just for the money. Do it because you love God and you want to get the gospel out to others. Amen. But do it. Meditate on it. Don't leave here today and forget about what we're saying. Take time to meditate. You know, that's some of the most relaxing times that you could have. I remember I used to take the girls out here on, across the street when we were in the yellow house there on the deck in the springtime and the bumblebees would be coming around and everything. And I used to sit there and tell them, look what they're doing. They're pollinating this or they're doing that. They just don't want to talk about something else. But I, <laughs> but I wanted them to see some of those things. I remember when the girls were young, we that's what we do. Psalm chapter 4. Psalm chapter 4. He says in verse 4, Stand in all and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Amen. But look at that. Stand in all and sin not. Commune with your heart upon your bed. I mean when you're laying down at night, when you're laying in bed, when you wake up and can't go back to sleep. I remember when Pastor Randall was teaching on the law, and I want to get into the book of Leviticus again. But when we're looking at the sacrifices, I just lay in bed at night, think about it. And then it's like I said in Leviticus chapter 1. There's a picture of God the Father offering God the Son through God the Holy Ghost. Amen. Because I was serious about it. God knew I was interested in learning about it. He just said, hey, look at this. I loved the priesthood. And when I saw that on the stones that day, you know what I was doing? I was sitting there studying and thinking, wow. And then when I read in Ezekiel, the Lord showed me that. I'm sure other people have seen it, but the Lord showed me. Yeah, the names on the breastplate of the believers, love and joy, and peace and long suffering. That's the fruit of the spirit. And we have a breastplate in the Melchizedek priesthood. And those are the stones of our breastplate. Because Israel had one, a physical one. We have a spiritual one. That's back when we would just meditate. We just think about the things that we heard in church. Amen. <clears throat> Proverbs, uh, Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs in chapter 4. If I can get there.
in verse 26. He says, ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. What do you say? Ponder thy path. That's what I did these last few days. That I was sitting there ill and bored. <laughs> Your head's too heavy to really read. You know, you ever, you've been that way where you're so stopped up. You, you try to read, but you can't, you can't even lift your head up. Amen. But I would just sit there and think. I might have something else going on at the same time, but I'd be sitting there meditating. I said, Frank, where are you headed? You don't have much time left, you know. You don't know how much time you have, but you, but you really don't have much time left as far as in the scale of life. Amen. Where are you headed? Where have you been? What have you been doing? And I'd sit there and meditate on the things of God that we used to meditate on. Think about where we've changed, where we've compromised, where we've let things slip. What I do is I just sit there and examine myself. And you know why? I, I was thinking about this too. I read something on it and I was going to share it. A lot of times the reason we doubt is because we're not communing with God. We're not meditating or there's something in our life. There's a sin in your life that you keep going back to. And you keep saying, I'm sorry, I'm messed up on this, I'm, I'm no good and Yet you keep going back to it. That's not going to give you assurance and peace. And that's why I always marveled at people that said they were saved could live in sin their whole life. You know, and now 40 years later, they're going to rededicate their life, Brother Dave. Amen. Amen. What's going on in your life? Is there something that God's putting his finger on and you refuse to get right? Is there something that you're not repenting of? Are you taking time to really meditate on the things of God? Do you know where Isaac was when Rebecca was headed his way? He was in the field. You know what he was doing? Meditate. Meditate. He went out in the field and he meditated. God brought him a wife. That's over in uh, Genesis in chapter 24 if you're interested. Uh... 1 Timothy chapter 4. I know this isn't a romping, stomping, running, jumping message, but I think it's a needful message. Amen. The church is really weak. I'm talking about the local church. 1 Timothy 4. I'm going to begin in verse 9. It said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by the prophecy, given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. 
Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself <coughs> and them that hear thee. You want to see people saved? You want to be assured of what you are? Meditate in those things. I think we're living in a very, very covetous world. People are out to grab all they can grab, get all they can get. It's like I said before, you can heap it up, but you can't haul it off. But what we send to heaven is already going to be there waiting on us. Do you know, I, I, realize, I didn't realize this for a long time, but the Bible says that we're not to even eat with the covetous. You know why? There's a sin there. There's a problem there. I've got a bunch of four verses, but I'm going to close with this. When we look at the creature, talking about nature, let us be looking at it through the eyes of the Lord, seeing God. And seeing the creature through God. That's what Adam and Eve were doing in the garden. They could wake up every morning and see the work of God. You know what the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ was? To restore us to that right relationship so we could do the same thing. How much do you meditate on the word of God? I won't ask you to be honest. But you know in your heart. How much interest you have in the word of God during the week. How much throughout the day. You know really Sunday we should be. Meditating on the, the word of God if any other day. We should do it every day but. Especially on the Lord's day. But a lot of times we have other plans, you know. People during the summer wear their bathing suits underneath their suit when they, so they could get it off quick enough to get out. They'd back in so they could get out fast. Or they'd have their boat hooked to it ready to hit the lake. But no time for God. They do their duty and run. What do you got planned today? The lazy ones are probably sleep. Huh? <laughs> I did that on purpose. <laughs> it's probably what I'll do too. <laughs> but at least while you're laying there upon your bed, meditate. Amen. Well, I hope you got a little something out of it. I hope you look at yourself, examine yourself, see where you're really at. You know, just to say that you're saved doesn't make you saved. Then I had a, I had a woman one time, I won't mention her name because you'd know her. I had her, she come up to the altar in the old building. She was crying and slobbering and said, I'm lost, I'm lost. Prayed and asked the Lord to save her. <clears throat> a few weeks later she says, no, I'm already saved. I wonder if they really are. There has been some issues there, you know. They're religious, but are they saved? You see, you need to stop and meditate. You need to think about yourself. See where you're really at. Is there really a love for God in my soul? Am I feeding my soul? Because if you don't, your flesh will starve it out. Are you really feeding your soul? You'll know when your soul begins to communicate with the Lord. Because they get excited together. That's different from just old church religion. Amen. Amen.
Well, I'm like my daughter's cookies. I'm overdone. But I'm only kidding. I like to buy them from Publix, you know, those uh, M&M chocolate chip cookies that Publix has. They don't cook them all the way. They leave them a little doughy. Yeah, that's why I don't go to Publix anymore. Amen. <laughs> Brother Dave dismisses, please. Amen. Lord, God, I'm going to say, Lord, it's been a good house. It's been a good day in the, in the Lord's house today, Lord God. Father, for what we heard in Sunday school class and the preaching hour, Lord. And Father, that... Uh, to be in close communication with you and communion with you uh, all the time, Lord. And it keeps us strong. It keeps us in our Bibles, Lord God. And Father, it keeps us strong in this in this world that we're living in today, Lord God. And Father, I do pray, Lord, that uh, you look after us. Father, that you guide us, guard us on through this week, Lord, until we meet at the next appointed time. And we thank you and praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Pray. Amen. Amen. Think about what brother.